And you hear the echo of the people of God singing the word of God. You know that there's power in this place because we're gathered in his name and we're gathered for one purpose, to glorify his holy name. Now what we need to do is look at what's wrong with us and then look at what's right with him and we'll see the solution. Most preaching today does one or the other. It either focuses on what's wrong with us or it focuses on what's right with him. But unless you admit to the dentist that you've got a toothache, it'll never get filled. He might have the best dental equipment in the world. He might be the top dentist in the country. Unless you admit to the doctor you've got a pain somewhere, he'll never be able to x-ray in that place. You can't walk into a doctor's office and he can look through you and go, aha, I see some cancer in there. He can't see that. You're going to have to go, doc, I've got a pain. Unless you admit what's wrong, you can never have what's right. Now, we know Jesus can do anything. There isn't a person that loves God in the whole universe that wouldn't say that God can do anything. Amen? Amen. Now, if God can do anything, and it's his will for a true revival to sweep across this world, a revival of righteousness and holiness and love for God, then what's the matter? God can do it. We all believe that. Yes. Even a three-year-old Sunday school student could tell you, God can do anything. He made the world. He, made, he keeps the moon in its orbit. He keeps the stars in the sky. He keeps our blood circulating. Who, who helps you breathe when you're asleep at night? Do you have to wake up every few seconds? Come on, breathe. <gasps> huh? Do you have to keep your heart beating? You know, wake up every three, three or four seconds? You know, you know, no. Who's digesting the dinner you had tonight? Are you? Or are you sitting there going, mm, it's kind of grizzly in here? Mm, mm, mm. How about a pregnant woman that's going to have a baby? Is she, you know, busy at night knitting together the fingers and the hands, you know? Ah, she plants the seed. And God knits it together in its mother's womb. So if God can do anything, what's the matter? Let me give you an example. God has called people, the church, to go into all nations and preach the gospel to every creature. That's a command, by the way. By the way, there's no such thing as an optional commandment in the Bible. Imagine that. Or Jesus would have get, well, you know, if you, if you feel like it, um, go into uh, almost every nation and uh, preach the gospel to whoever you feel led, you know? Glory. <laughs> ah, he says, go ye into all nations, preach the gospel to every creature. He doesn't say every person. By the way, there is a, there is a word in the Greek for person, but he said creature. That is so to leave... No doubt, he wants you to preach to every person, you know. If you go through a barnyard, start preaching, and there might be a person out there working with the pigs, you know. <laughs> preach to everything, everybody. Today we've got a Christianity, I call it cool for Christ. <laughs> Everybody's so cool, yeah, you know, hey man, praise God, you know. Hey. <laughs> Glory, you know. You know, it's kind of like secret agent for the Lord, double O nothing, you know. <laughs> Everybody's being a silent witness, right? <laughs> Your witness, Your Honor. Where were you on the night of February 4th? <laughs> That's us, you know, the whole world. Every person in this world depends on us, every one of us. You know what, you know, let me tell you, what would you do if the fire department, they dig this, right? You see a house across the street, it's burning. People are screaming, ah, help me, you know, hanging out, you know, the window, you know, people are burning up, it's terrible, you know, and you call the fire department. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. <laughs> you know, imagine on the other end, what if the fire, what if the headline says, thousands burn while fire department sleeps? I'd get a new fire department, wouldn't you? Guess what? We're the fire department. We're called to put out the fire of hell in people's lives. Not the preachers, not the pastors, not the Billy Grahams, not the Oral Roberts, not the Keith Greens, not the Winky Prattneys, not the Jeff Hops, but every single person is called to be somebody who puts out the fires of hell in their friends and their neighbors and their loved ones and their enemies' lives. Why aren't we doing it? 
Because we're all cool for Christ. Because we're so busy playing church that nothing's getting done. We're so busy enjoying. Oh, glory. I'm just enjoying. I'm having such a good time in the Lord. Oh, ooh, you know? Oh, did you hear this new gospel record coming out? Praise God. You know? Hey, man, we're going down to hear this gospel concert. You know, people are rotting. They're burning by the day. How many people here know somebody that's died in the last year? Raise your hand if you know somebody who's died in the last year. Okay? How many people know somebody who's died in the last year that wasn't a Christian? Be honest. Okay, raise your hand. Okay. Now, don't put your hand up because I don't want to embarrass you. Did you witness to that person before they die? I don't want to hear the hands or anything. This is between you and God. You know what? What is witnessing? Is witnessing saying, God loves you. has a wonderful plan for your life. Please read these four spiritual laws track. You know? <laughs> What's witnessing? You know? Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Here. You know? Can you imagine if Jesus went around handing out tracks to people? You know? Heal me. Heal me. Heal me. Here, have a track. Goodbye. You know? <laughs> You know what, man? We're so embarrassed. And I know what it is. You know, you ride up in an elevator. You know, the only thing, that, the only thing to do in an elevator is not look at the other guy. <laughs> right? You walk in an elevator, you've got three floors to tell them the whole plan of salvation, you know? And I get so embarrassed. I do. You know, my spirit wants to witness to him. My body says, uh-uh. Now, it's not like I'm Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but when I'm pointing the finger at the church, now you watch this. If I'm pointing the finger at the church, there's three fingers pointing back at me. See that? I'm part of the church, and tonight we're all going to take a beating in the Lord. Tonight we're all going to be scorched. Tonight we're all going to be whipped in love. Because unless our eyes are opened, we'll never see. And unless we see the darkness and the hypocrisy and the compromise and the half-hearted serving that we all call Christianity today, we'll never have anything better. If you're satisfied with a heating system in a cold house, you'll never have better heat. And if you're satisfied with the air conditioning in a hot house, you'll never have better air conditioning. If you're satisfied living with rags, you'll never get better clothes. If you're satisfied living in a world where people are dying in hell every single day, sinking down into the pits of hell, then you'll never reach them and no one else will. We're all hoping that God's going to do something, and God's hoping that we'll do something. For He has given us every tool under heaven. He's given us the Holy Spirit to empower us. He's given us the Bible to teach us and feed us. He's given us the blood to wash us from sin. He's given us the fellowship and the church so that we can have people to cry with and pray with and rejoice with. He's given us all these tools, and in Revelation 19 it says, Hallelujah, for the wedding supper of the Lamb has come, for her bri his bride has made herself ready. Listen to that. His bride has made herself ready. The Christian church is kind of sitting back going, la-di-da, you know. <laughs> oh, Lord, give me a manicure, you know. <laughs> we want God to do all the work, and he gives us tools. It's one thing when the kid's six months old. I mean, he can't diaper himself. He can't feed himself. When he's six years old, he can clothe himself. He can feed himself. When he's 16, he better not start going around, hi, mommy. You know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. God knows we're not babies anymore. Sure, there's baby Christians in here, but most of us aren't. Some of us are two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen years old in the Lord. What are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? How come I don't hear reports? of revival in Perth. For the same reason you don't hear reports of revival in L.A. Because there isn't any. Why not? It's not that the Christians don't want it. I mean, how many people here would like to see revival in this city? Raise your hand. Everybody wants it. I'll show you why there isn't any. How many people here spend, spend 20 seconds, at least 20 seconds every day praying for revival in the city? Every day. Okay. Why isn't there any revival? <laughs> Do you see what's going on? We're a bunch of blasted hypocrites. We are. We are saying we love God. And then we say we love the sinners. And then we do zilch. We do nothing about it. I don't call that Christianity. I call it church. The church is supposed to be living Christianity. But just like this building, when there's nobody in it, it can't go to heaven. And just like us, when we're not doing what we're called to do, we're, we're, we're a waste of God's time. Certainly, he might have redeemed us, but what did he redeem us for? Why does God keep people on the earth after we're saved? 
You know, why don't they just baptize us and hold us under? We'll go right to heaven. It's for your own good. Oh, backsliding. Right? How come an evangelist, when he, you know, he leads people to the Lord, he says, okay, everybody wants to get saved, raise their hand. Takes out a gun. No backsliding in the kingdom. Okay, why not? You know why? Because we got a job to do here. We're not here to enjoy it. This place is, is this place called earth is, is really bad news. Hey man, this place is hell compared to heaven. It's heaven compared to hell too. <laughs> this place is right in the middle between the two places. God does not leave us here to have a good time. He doesn't leave us here so that we can raise children and get a good job just for ourselves. He doesn't leave us here so we can get a nice education and get nice things just for ourselves. He's left us here to do one thing, and that's to spread his gospel through our family, our jobs, our schooling, whatever we do. And unless we start taking that seriously, then he's going to close shop, and we'll be in it when it's closed. I can't promise you anything. No amount of sinner's prayer is going to save you or me. No amount of religious reading or religious service is going to save you or me. Jesus Christ is going to save us. And if we're saved, we're going to have the fruit of saved people. And if we have the fruit of saved people, people will be getting saved. The day of Pentecost came. 3,000 people got saved in one day in the same city that killed Jesus just a few weeks before. What do you think? What was going on? The people were so on fire that their fire spread. It's your fault and my fault if the people around us don't get saved. It isn't the evangelist or the Jesus ministries or the church's fault. Because who is the church? It's us. It's our fault. All I'm trying to say is this. We have a job to do, and unless we do it, we're worse than infidels. It says in the Bible, a man will not, who not to care for his own family is worse than an infidel. I think a Christian that will not take care of sinners is worse than an infidel too, because who is our family? The family of man. Who are we called to take care of? The people next door? Yeah. The people, our relatives? Yeah. Our teachers, our students, the guy at the, at the petrol station? Yeah. Why aren't we spreading the gospel? Because one, we're embarrassed, two, we're disobedient, three, we're lazy, four, we're apathetic, and five, we're hypocrites. How many people have you led to Jesus the last year? And if you haven't, why haven't you? Has everybody turned you down? At least Jeremiah had an excuse. He preached for 45 years, didn't have one convert. Noah had an excuse. He preached for 100 years, not one convert. Do you have an excuse? How long have you preached? We're all called to be living epistles, living ambassadors. And unless we do something about it, our faith is in vain. And this is what God told me to tell you tonight. I have no apologies for it. All I can tell you is this. I love you dearly. I love you deeply. That's why I'm here. That's why I left my, my wife and my son and came here, not for gain, but so that there would be a spiritual revival in this country. Not that I'm the one to bring it. God will bring it. If I drop dead tonight, he'll bring it. If I go home, he doesn't need me. He needs all of us. And I'm here because I love you. I love him. I want to be obedient. And the word that I bring tonight is from his book. It's from his heart. It's from his desire for each of us. And unless you listen with your heart, it's just going to be a waste of time.